Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to this uh, colloquium series entitled Unintended Consequences of the Information Age. It also gives me a great deal of pleasure to be in the position to introduce our moderator uh, this evening, uh, my friend and colleague, Ed Lazowska. Uh, it's difficult, actually, to put the term moderation and Ed Lazowska in the same sentence, I must say. <coughs> Uh, many of you know that Ed is the Bill and Melinda Gates Chair uh, for Computer Science and Engineering here at the University of Washington. Uh, he has, uh, for some time uh, earlier in his career, served as a distinguished chair uh, of the, uh, Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, and during his leadership of that, uh, that department, uh, brought that department uh, to its preeminent status here uh, nationally and internationally. Um, Ed is... Uh, uh, in short, uh, an exceptional individual. Uh, he is a leading scholar and researcher and teacher in the field of computer science and engineering. Uh, he uh, serves a, or has committed himself to a very active service role uh, in a range of different scientific and professional communities and foundations uh, regionally and uh, internationally. Um, uh, he uh, uh, is, in short, uh, uh, the most connected uh, and engaged, uh, visible, active, intelligent, I'll stop short at handsome, person that, uh, person that I know. Uh, many of you may know that uh, in 2004, Ed Lazowska was identified by the Seattle Times as one of the five most influential people in the region. Uh, and there's uh, no doubt in my mind that that's, that's the case. Uh, so there's no better person in my view uh, to moderate uh, this important discussion on, uh, on privacy that we're going to have uh, this evening. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to hand our panellists and you over to the tender mercies of my friend and colleague, Ed Lazowska. Well, thanks very much, Harry, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. There are many situations over the past, say, 30, 40 years before everything became uh, mounted on the web, when uh, a lot of information about you was available, but it was available in a collection of distributed physical records, okay, physically distributed physical records. So assembling a reasonable composite view of you, or even some narrow aspect of you, like your medical history, was very difficult to do. These days, it's much easier to do because techniques such as databases and data mining make it possible to assemble a composite uh, portrait of, uh, of you and your comings and goings, whether it's your medical records, your credit card purchases. I mean, clearly the credit card company, for example, has a fairly uh, extensive record of your purchasing power. Your supermarket has a, a very detailed record of everything you've bought at the supermarket. Um, I guess there are conveniences to that. It lets them know what to stock. Uh, it might let them know what items to locate together. Uh, uh, there are a, a variety of reasons why this might benefit you as an individual, but there's a cost. Your, your buying patterns are, uh, are exposed. Uh, so I think of this as always involving this kind of cost-benefit trade-off. And the question is, how much of your privacy are you willing to give up in return for the benefit? So let me take just a second and introduce uh, each of the five panelists, and then uh, we'll ask them one at a time to uh, come up and, uh, uh, and uh, talk with you about uh, their particular slant on privacy. Uh, the first panelist is Kirk Bailey. Uh, Kirk is the Chief Information Security Officer for the University of Washington, the uh, first person to hold that role at the University of Washington. Secondly is uh, Ivan Orton. Uh, Ivan is uh, a King County prosecuting attorney who uh, prosecuted the first cybercrime case in the state of Washington in 1983. So he's been in this business uh, uh, a very, very long time, uh, exposing and prosecuting uh, cybercrime uh, in our state. Uh, third, we'll hear from John Christensen with the uh, Christensen uh, Law Firm. Uh, John's firm uh, focuses on uh, protecting information technologies. So essentially, uh, IP activities related to information technology. And he's got a wealth of experience in, uh, in IT law. Uh, fourth, Ken Kuski, who's the uh, president of IP3 Incorporated, which is a, a market research firm. 
uh, and has uh, focused in, uh, uh, in recent years extensively on information assurance and IT security technologies and companies. Uh, finally, Brett Matsky is with the Computer and Information Sciences Directorate at the Pacific Northwest National Labs. Uh, the nation's energy labs, uh, among other things, are the largest performer of, uh, uh, of science and engineering research uh, funded by the Department of Homeland Security. So in uh, all of the labs, and particularly PNNL, there's enormous expertise in uh, cybersecurity and uh, other issues uh, r related to uh, national security, whether chemical, biological, uh, radiation. So the labs are a huge resource to, uh, uh, to the nation and, and to our region. So we're delighted to have Brett here today. With that, let me welcome you again and uh, turn this over to Kirk. For the last two decades, I have uh, made my living dealing with these often ugly, unintended consequences of technology. Uh, my morning mirror tells me daily that I'm an aging security guy with uh, an advancing number of gray hairs on my head on a regular basis. And uh, on bad days at my job, I find myself fighting the temptation to become a bit of a cynic about this new information age we're living in. As a result, my work experience um, and my thinking about all that I deal with on a daily basis um, and have dealt with on a daily basis has uh, forced me to develop some very strong opinions about uh, technology and privacy. So uh, it's very important that I take a moment of your valuable time to invoke the standard disclaimer, and there it is up there. Uh, these views and opinions that I express this evening are my own and not those of my employer. I wanted to be clear about that, that's for sure. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, some of what Ed already did. I won't go into, he, he overlaid nicely on what I wanted to say. Matter of fact, stole most of my thunder. So what I'd like to do is just brush over some of those initial comments. Uh, these are remarkable days that we're living in. Uh, our daily lives, of course, are being shaped and transformed on a regular basis by technology at an incredible rate. Uh, unfortunately, above all, what I observe most in my job is something that I'm not very pleased to witness. And it is the, uh, the, the horrible fact that I see uh, an enormous amount of apathy on the part of the general public about technology and privacy, about technology and what they're doing with technology. Uh, by apathy, I don't mean indifference, I mean just uh, uh, they tend to have somewhat of a, a selfish attitude about it, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, and it seems to me that unless folks are directly harmed by some misuse of information about them, or if they uh, suffer some kind of, of other incidental uh, r related activity because of technology, uh, privacy violations, they seem not to have much interest in taking any action to deal with it. Uh, that is a clear observation and one that frustrates me enormously. Uh, does anybody here remember the Choice Point fiasco? I don't want to go over too much old ground. I'm sure you all remember it from February of last year. It's happened 14 months ago. Uh, to refresh your memory, Choice Point uh, describes itself as the nation's leading provider of, inf of identification and credential verification services. Um, they're, what, they're what they're called is a commercial data broker which is really kind of an ugly term if you think about it. These people collect and mine data about all of us and make money from that uh, on a regular basis. Uh, in a recent uh, uh, quarterly report to the Securities and Exchange Commission, they revealed the extent of their operations and their business services. And I'll read from you what they said they did it for a living as an executive statement. Uh, they sell claims history data, that's insurance information, mortgage, vehicle record information, police records, credit information, and profiling services of individuals related to credit information, employment background screenings, test drug administration services, public record searches, and vital record services, credential v verification, professional and otherwise educational, uh, due diligence information, uniform commercial code searches and filings, uh, DNA identification services, uh, authentication services and people and shareholder location, uh, locator information services, teleservices database and campaign management services, among others. Um, their interest in providing data profiles runs deep uh, into a very granular part of our lives. Anyway, I, I, I don't know if you recall, uh, but in February last year, the story broke that ChoicePoint had inadvertently and unwittingly sold, mind you, they made money off of this, they sold the private records of 145,000 U.S. citizens to what turned out to be criminals who had registered for their services. Uh, the reason I cite this particular incident, it's one of the only times in my recollection where a national outcry or a large public outcry occurred because of this particular, because of a privacy violation. And I enjoyed the dialogue that ensued. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's uh, for me, a real ugly, uh, the real ugly upshot of the whole event, however, is the fact that uh, today 
choice point still is not accountable for any identity theft uh, costs associated with this particular uh, breach. And because of that, they find it not necessary in their operational budgets to include uh, necessary funds to protect against that kind of liability. And this is true of institutions uh, I've, I, I, I'm aware of in the, in the private and public sector. Uh, affording security is not a top priority based on business mission in many instances. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that there aren't great values and missions uh, in concert with the public's interests. It's just that uh, security is not often afforded because there is little accountability for protection of privacy. There's not a lot of incentive. Uh, I also found something very interesting that grew out of the choice point uh, experience. If you go to a website, uh, the one that's listed up here, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, these people have done a very interesting uh, reactive job of setting up some information for all of us to uh, look at. And I look at it daily. Uh, what it is, is a, they, they've put on their webpage lots of information about privacy, which I encourage you to review. They, they have lots of good content to feed your thoughts about privacy. They also have started something called the Chronology of Data Breaches Reported Since Choice Point Incident. And what's happened is 24 states have adopted, uh, like California did, which revealed the choice point incident for the public, uh, no, uh, data breach notification requirements. Um, they have culled the newspapers on a daily basis finding instances of data breaches, and they've listed it on this, this listing. And what's remarkable about it is it now includes uh, over 160 published incidences that have resulted in notification letters of security breaches going out to some 55 million Americans. Now, you'd think that would have an impact on the public's interest in privacy, but to date, I see very little, very, very little interest in dealing with it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I point to this week and this week alone. Um, in the news, which is costing you more is a question I'd like to pose to you. National headlines are, are, are quick to pick up the $3 a gallon cost of gasoline, which, of course, impacts all of our lives. You know, all of you drive SUVs, I'm sorry. We have a new payment to make. Um, uh, but what bothered me in the same week, in the same few days, a terrible security breach at uh, the University of Texas Austin, uh, a sister institution, um, had, had uh, data records of over 200,000 people exposed because of intruders. Um, and I ask the question every time I see uh, or learn about a story like this, why isn't this national news for all of us? This kind of security breach is quite costly for all of us in the long run. Um, and, it's, and it's an interesting question that I often uh, consider and I ask you to think about uh, as well. Uh, something is wrong, in my opinion, by the way, that the public is not fully appreciating the emerging picture of significant unintended consequences that we're seeing related to privacy. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit now, since I don't want to take too much time, about uh, what it would take to fix the privacy problem. Uh, and I'm going to tell you some quick personal experiences and then a couple of professional comments to just give you an idea how difficult the problem is to solve, if there is a solution for protecting privacy. So, uh, first of all, in 1999, during the thick of the internet bubble at the, at the height of it, I uh, asked 12 of my colleagues, un with, in collaboration with the New York Times and under the supervision of law enforcement and lawyers, to see if they could conduct a, a full privacy raid on, on myself. And they did. They took uh, six or eight weeks, I can't remember how much, spent $100, and produced for me and the New York Times to see uh, my life. And they did it for less than $100 without breaking any laws. Uh, chief amongst the, the, the worrisome things they, they gathered was my birth record, my, my, my uh, birth certificate that was notarized by the county, which is a legal document for my identity. They had everything else you could possibly think about me, including my grades, performance reviews from work, all my, uh, all my neighbors and their phone numbers, past friends I likely had in school, all the teachers, uh, my student grades, my student records. Uh, they had uh, all my phone records for the last five years, and they had other service providers' information or records, accounts that are mailed to me, that would be normally mailed to me privately. And the thing that was interesting about this raid is I tried remediation on this horrible event, this, this un, uh, unnerving experience, to be truthful. I tried to figure out what I could do to fix it so that the next person couldn't get it. Uh, and by the way, a quick side note, the only person I offended in this after trying to protect my own privacy and, and potential embarrassment was my mother because it was revealed that I was born through C-section. And when she saw that a medical condition of hers was printed in the New York Times, um, I didn't eat very well at my mother's house for quite some time. I had an unintended consequence in my own mother's life. So I've learned to be very sensitive about privacy. Um, at any rate, what I was going to say about uh, the whole thing is that I tried to remediate. And the remediation included me going to my service providers, like the telephone companies that gave them uh, my telephone records. Um, and the reason they were able to get it is because my telephone service provider had put an online service there uh, on the web for 
people to be able to go and access to manage their account and to get account information and order new billings or, or records of your phone conversation or of your of your phone records. And I didn't know they had been put out there, although they said to me that it had been sent in a billing and I just missed it. Um, but somebody in that group had actually taken enough information about me that they had gathered and used it to log on to that particular service website, claim that account, and use it. And they used it to order uh, change of address and different mailing information and copies of my phone records. This is the kind of opt-in, opt-out problem I want to bring up to you folks. Um, opt-in, opt-out is a terrible uh, uh, problem for all of us. Right now it's convenient for all service providers to choose to perform what's called opt-out. In other words, they'll throw all their customers' data out and available on the web and only take it off if customers ask. The reason they do that is it's cheap. It'd be much more expensive for them to solicit each and every one of us to ask our permission to put that information out there. So when I entered all these different service providers who had given up me and my privacy, they said, well, we can take it out, uh, but, uh, you know, out of, the, out, of the, out of the records, but the truth is um, uh, this is what people want. People want the convenience that Ed mentioned. In professional work, I want to mention that often security professionals are left out of the mix in conversations about technology. Uh, that isn't true everywhere, but in many institutions, uh, both public and private, I know that uh, security is, is an often neglected area of interest. It isn't because they're not interested in it, it's just that it uh, is, is not necessarily forgotten about. It's often considered um, an incidental, a requirement to be met, and it isn't given full force of discussion, uh, full place in the discussions. And that's something you may want to encourage your service providers and institutions you work with or associated with to reconsider. Um, that's, a, that's a plug for the security industry, so I appreciate you taking time to do that. Also, vendors work against us. Vendors work very much against us, and they do terrible things to us by calling their products unbreakable or absolutely secure, and uh, vendors with large names and lots of money and research and lots of reputation have, seems to have more influence uh, with business leaders than their own security professionals. A good example of that was Oracle's claim that they were unbreakable, uh, and that, that quote alone or that slogan made it difficult. So in closing, I want to um, pose to you an interesting question. Um, uh, currently, the public's demand for convenience and convergence technology and flashy toys that you all want to have um, uh, is driving much of the technology marketplace and the protection measures that are, are, are ascribed to protecting privacy. Uh, it's disturbing to me that technology marketplace caters to some of society's less attractive character qualities, and that's their vanity, sometimes greed, and insatiable appetite for convenience. Um, I, I really um, have to believe that leaving uh, the, the decisions about privacy to the marketplace and not you as uh, individual participants in the public forum is, is a bad choice. And I would encourage you to think about that question, who should, you uh, who should determine uh, how much protection should be for your own private data? With that, thank you very much. Okay, let me now uh, invite Ivan Orton from the uh, King County Prosecutor's Fraud Division to speak to us. As I was walking to the campus, to this meeting through the campus this evening, I noticed in front of me, out of the corner of my eye, some thready material, and before I knew it, I was in the midst of a spider web that must have been about 10 feet tall, and the spider landed on my shirt, and I'm sure going through that spider's mind were the words from the two spiders in the Far Side cartoon who had put a spider web across the bottom of a slide, and one of them was saying to the other, if we pull this off, we'll eat high on the hog all winter. And so I think the spider on my shirt was figuring, I've got somebody, I've got somebody here, and I was like, <laughs> Flicked that, flicked that little SOB aside and walked on. I started thinking, uh, isn't it ironic that the word that we use to describe in a common sense or common terms the, the mode of the internet that most of us access is a word that's used to describe in scientific terms uh, a, a trap that you go into that lures you in and then leads you to being poisoned and killed and eaten. <laughs> And I thought, somebody had the right idea in mind when they named this. <laughs> I'm going to follow directly on. Kirk and I did not coordinate, and neither did we coordinate with the questioners in the audience, but some things are going to flow directly from them. And I want to talk a little bit about how information about you is created, distributed, and what's done with it, and where the weaknesses are in that chain. Because I've identified what I think are some red herrings as to what we can do to protect ourselves and our privacy and where we should be pointing our true triggers, and I mean that almost li literally at. If you start off by talking about how is data created, data is created in a number of ways, and you can see a list of those up on the screen. Some of those you have a substantial amount of say about, but some of them, like you're born, data is created about you uh, at that moment. 
data is disseminated by you, some of this personal information which is created is disseminated by you voluntarily, sometimes less voluntarily, but these are some examples of how you disseminate this personal information about yourself. And data then is disseminated about you by others, frequently without your knowledge or control. This data is often, certainly in modern days, collected in length by credit reporting companies and by companies like ChoicePoint, who take these disparate pieces of data which exist out there and put them all associated with your name and personal identifiers. This data is acquired in a number of ways, but primarily it's acquired by some database being compromised or your information being shared with someone with an evil intent. And finally, this data about you is used. Extenders of credit issue credit cards in your name, loans in your name, all of the other things that happen with the data once it's obtained from you. And I started thinking about, well, what part of this do I control and what part of this do I not control and what part of this am I responsible for? And my bottom line was those are the things that I have at least some say in the creation and dissemination of the data. These are ones where I have virtually no say in the creation and dissemination of data and yet these are the things that I'm liable for. When the data is misused or stolen, it's not just the things that I'm responsible for creating or spreading, it's things that are out of my control that come back to haunt me. And so I thought, and thinking about this, I thought, doesn't it make sense, and just read it for yourself. You have the inconvenience cost of the things that you create and distribute, and you shouldn't have to bear the inconvenience cost of things you don't create or distribute. This is not, to, to paraphrase the common saying, this is not rocket science in any way. This is pretty simple phrasing when you think about it. There's, I, I can't imagine anybody who would really fundamentally disagree with this. The question is, why aren't the costs allocated this way? Because they're certainly not, and certainly in terms of inconvenience costs, they're not allocated the way that I would suggest. And th the question I pose is a larger question is, how can we remove the barriers, because I consider them, they have to be barriers, because the natural way would seem to be that I'm responsible for the things that I create and distribute, and somebody else who creates and distributes it is responsible for what they've created and distributed. There has to be some barrier that's stopping that kind of allocation. So the stuff that's created by me, disseminated by me, pretty simple. I should be responsible for that, although I have this question that if you're required to give that data to your government, to an, uh, an industry to do business with them, how much of this is really within your control to actually make the decision to disseminate it. But for data that's gathered or disseminated by others, for data dissemination by others, shouldn't there be an opt-in rather than an opt-out? Right now, we all get the notices every year. You get them when you sign up for a website. Do you want us to send this information to, to other people? Do you want us to share it with other people? The, the default should always be no on that. It should require an affirmative act. You should be able to compel people to remove information about you that's been disseminated without your permission. For data collecting and linking, and that's another important part of this stage, this is where ChoicePoint fits into this, you should have to opt in to be included in that system. Uh, the dissemination should be disclosed to you. You should have the ability to compel the removal of your information from that system. Unauthorized acquisition, we're getting some steps in this direction where you should be notified of misuse and there should be uh, liability for misuse shouldn't be on you, it should be completely on the people who are misusing it. And then there should be liability on the part of those who accept false information to create credit, to create the harm that actually comes to you. It shouldn't, the burden shouldn't be on you to stop this and to contact everybody, the, sh the burden should be on people who've accepted this false information in the first place. So in fact, I showed you a model before that looked a little bit like this, but the right side of this equation should be different. It should look like this. These are the things that I should be liable for, and these are the things that somebody else should be liable for because I don't have any say in them. I don't engage in the dissemination of that information, and I have no control over how safely they keep that information or what they use it for. Because I have such limited control 
over the information about me that's used by others that can impact me directly. It seems like this, this screen really sums it up uh, in terms of what I should be responsible for and what I shouldn't be responsible for. And in fact, if you think about it, why isn't it like this? I mean, this, th what, these ideas that I'm coming up with are not rocket science by any means. This is pretty much common sense. This is the way it should be. Why isn't it this way? Why aren't the people who disseminate the information issue credit based on that information, the ones who should not only suffer the loss of the credit card companies say, you know, if, if your credit was misused, uh, if your credit card was misused without your permission, you're only responsible for the first $50. And I go, phew, they have to eat all the other, other costs. Except when somebody else has used my credit card and bills have gone unpaid or used my identity and bills have gone unpaid, who has to clean up the mess? It's not the credit card company who accepted the bogus uh, credit card application in my name. They don't have to clean up the mess. I'm the one who has to clean up the mess. I have this three years that Kirk talked about that it takes to clean up the problems from credit messes. Why should the onus be on me to do that? And I really don't think it should. And so my simple proposition here is you should be responsible for the costs associated with the information that you disseminate and other people should be responsible for their own dissemination and use of that information including accepting information without a sufficient security checks and issuing credit based on a bogus application. I shouldn't have any responsibility for that. I mean any. I shouldn't be required to go around and tell people it wasn't me. Once I've identified that this is the problem, I should be able to turn to the bank that issued my credit card to somebody else and say clean it up. Come back to me when it's done and the clock is running on your damages. Something like that. Doesn't that make sense? Why should it be any other way than that? So my bottom line conclusion on all of this is I don't think, quite frankly, that I can protect my own personal identity. Short of never exposing personal identifying information to anybody else, having a name like my name makes me a pretty unique character. You do a Google, you get me and this character on uh, uh, one of the space shows. I'm, that's it. That's it. There's, there's also somebody with my name in Oregon. I need to change my name to John Jones, and then maybe it's less onerous when this information about me is disseminated. The next step in this process of who should be liable, I'm not even really sure that we should put the onus on the people who maintain the databases. Because I think, quite frankly, in this day and age, it's unrealistic to expect that data to stay secure. It's just not going to. And to, and to build safety of your credit around uh, the belief that this data will be maintained securely by these companies, it's just not going to happen. So I really put, at least for financial use of this data, the onus upon the people who accept the data and make decisions. And what they've done is said, we can make the, the credit application process easy. We realize that we're going to have this much cost because we're going to get bogus credit applications, we're going to have to write off some charges, but we make this much profit. And I'm saying, how about they be responsible not just for everything above the first $50, how about they're responsible for cleaning it up? Because that's the real problem that they've created, and all of a sudden it costs this much and earns us this much, might be it costs this much and earns us this much, maybe we should have a more rigorous way of examining the application for credit. I don't have the answers here, that's not my field as to how you set that up. I realize consumer convenience is a driving factor in the decisions to how to issue credits. So you can apply for a credit card online and get a decision in five minutes. And you can get a credit card sent out to the address that you put on there. Now there's some checks on it, but they're not the kind of checks that make it anywhere near foolproof. And I would say it's that person who's creating the actual harm here Again, talking financially, not talking about personal information, the harm is not that someone else knows it, but that someone else can use it. And I think the onus for responsibility for correcting any problems with that should be on the people who accept that information and allow it to be used without your permission in a way that harms you, not just that $50, but the three years of cleanup. Thanks for your time. Next, John Christensen from the Christensen IT Law Firm. Okay, I'm going to shift gears on us a bit here. 
and I'm going to talk a little bit more about history and a little bit more about things other than our specific, you know, current concerns about credit and identity, th identity theft and fraud of that nature, uh, which are legitimate concerns and very much this year's concerns. I'm not saying they're going to be solved, but I suspect they're going to be overwhelmed and we're going to see bigger problems coming down the pike. I happen to be involved in some of them. Um, so I have a slightly different set of concerns. As I think some of you know, uh, I've spent the last few years trying to get a handle on what the legal standards ought to be for information protection, where they're going or where they're likely to go and what drives these things because frankly, I found myself unable to really substantively advise my clients in, in a way I thought was useful if I didn't try to figure out what are the drivers behind information protection laws what are the standards that work? What have we learned that hasn't worked? And I discovered that nobody had actually gone out and done this. So, you know, um, it was a fascinating task. I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot. Um, I hope it proves useful. And I think, uh, I'm hoping I can give you a little sense of the trends that we're going to see. Also, from a lawyer's point of view, keep in mind, um, laws are, especially Anglo-American common law, and, and our legislation tends to follow the same sort of pattern. It looks backwards, it's based on precedent. What's, what have we done before? Uh, this is not a bad thing. Uh, it keeps the law from moving too quickly. Bad laws can be very bad things for a society, and even a very good law is something of a meat ax. It's, it's a very blunt instrument because it operates at a high level of generality. So I don't think we want to move into defining legal standards too soon, though we do need to do that. I can have some comments on to how, as to how well we happen to do it. But basically, the problem we've got is that the technologies we're trying to deal with are very new in human history, which means that from a lawyer's point of view, I can't look back very far and figure out what to do with that. Some of you know this uh, active defense project that uh, we've been advising Kirk with, mostly to say, Kirk, please don't try to intervene in other people's computer systems. Um, a lot of the analogies that Ivan and I were working with were going back to, you know, uh, sort of weird uh, trespass cases where people were cleaning trees off the highway in the Middle Ages and things like that. Uh, there are some precedent that's useful. It's what we've got. It tells us how human beings react Act, and that's what we're trying to work with. But how do you do that, and what does it all mean? Well, I'm going to tell you it's not very organized, but first I'm going to show you the culprits for our problem. First off, ENIAC 1946, the granddaddy of them all in terms of computers. Um, I think that when you look at this, it was about not much smaller than this room if you include the, uh, the HVAC that had to support that incredibly heat-producing beast. And it was really much better th at doing ballistics, you know, calculations for shooting shells than anything had been before, but it wasn't really good for a whole lot else. Well, you know, Moore's Law begins to kick in, uh, though I don't think we were dealing in silicon at that point, but seriously, um, the technology's evolved quickly as these things go, certainly from a legal standpoint. By 65, we had main th mainframes throughout offices, uh, not super common, but universities would have had them to start managing attendance. You had them in banks, you had them in insurance companies, Crucially, you had them in big governmental agencies. This made it possible to start doing impressive things in healthcare, like billing for Medicare and things like that, which became very important. So basically, we're starting to have these big beasts infiltrating offices, but they're not real easy to use. Uh, a, a dedicated priesthood of weirdos were basically the people who could actually put data in and get data out. It was not friendly. However, by 1975, we had this portable computer, um, and I could probably just about pick that up. Um, but you'll notice it has a keyboard, and it's something that you can, a user who speaks English can communicate to more or less in something like English. Um, I actually learned how to do punch cards, and I'm really glad we got keyboards, uh, because punch cards really suck. But this was a portable computer, and this begins to penetrate out further. It gets even smaller. It becomes something that, you know, um, if, if, you're, if you're geeky and advanced enough, by the early 80s, you can have these things, and you can work with them, and you can do things. And, you know, this has more power than any act by a long shot, even by 81. And now we're shrinking it even further, not too, too much further along after that. The, the, I think, as far as I can tell, this was like the first laptop, uh, though I don't think they called it that. It was just a highly portable computer. Now, I had, I had not really remembered that uh, these little PDAs were starting to pop up in 93, I guess because I couldn't. it was not a toy I could afford or could use at that point. But now we've got, you know, uh, incredible quantities of memory that you can store in incredibly small things. 
and in incredibly cute things, in blackberries, in iPods, in rubber duckies. Um, I think, frankly, this is one reason why we're not having so much of a concern about it is because we've gone from an era when mainframes were computers and big and scary like Hal to, you know, oh, this is my cute little computer thingy and it does all the, it plays music to me and it downloads ringtones and it does all this cool stuff and it surveils me, but I don't know about that part. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, we missed the boat sometime after 1974 with privacy law in this country. Um, as of the early 70s, we were actually having a very robust debate about privacy on many levels in this country. And a lot of it was very important to to this area um, because of computers, because of big scary computers, but also because of disclosures of governmental activities that <clears throat> some people thought were perhaps inappropriate. Uh, that is actually a concern I have right now, which is that I think we're beginning to enter an era that has some of the smell of the early 70s in terms of disclosures of governmental activities and maybe what's going on with big scary computers and total information awareness type projects. But we got out of that period the Privacy Act. The Federal Privacy Act applies only to federal agencies, but it was a groundbreaker. It laid the, the groundwork for um, what is still a pretty good set of privacy principles today. And they became, they moved out and became the foundation for European Union law, and they're still sort of what we build on today. But I'll tell you the truth, I think we tend to weaken them. Um, well, what happened after 74? Not much until HIPAA came along. Why did HIPAA come along? We Because we had a big public initiative to force healthcare to computerize on a massive scale, and the people who were behind that looked around and said, you know, people might be scared of these big computers. They were thinking mainframes then. This was, you know, building up to that early 90s, the reports were coming out that were saying we should do this. So their thought was still big, scary mainframes, even though the world was moving rapidly beyond that. So they said, okay, we got to do privacy, we got to do security, we got to put it in HIPAA, and HIPAA will deal with that. HIPAA was really an accidental privacy law. It was really about technology facilitation on the level we're talking about. Um, but it's a patch. We're dealing here now with two patches, and this is the pattern we're seeing here. We've got a patch for federal government agencies, we've got a patch for healthcare organizations. But if you look at that, um, assume that the whole white screen is the area of information you might want to keep private. Well, you now have a patch over two little places. But we have now we enter the era of e-commerce, and this is what we're going to see in the next few slides here, is we've got, you know, okay. Somehow we've got to negotiate the ability to move data back and forth between the United States and the European Union because the European U Union has diverged from us. And there was a point in the early 90s when the EU and the US came to a fork in the road in the woods and the US took the one that frankly is somewhat less traveled by. The EU took one that led them to a more a broader, more comprehensive approach to data protection, which in many ways um, is conceptually much easier to work with as far as I'm concerned, and I build a lot of that into my contracts uh, because the concepts are good. But if American companies were gonna move data back and forth to the EU, they had to begin to come into something like compliance. So we got another patch on there for companies that are working in the EU. Uh, we want to start uh, enabling financial institutions to do more with data and various other things. So we've got the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. So we throw up another patch there that applies to banks and insurance companies and so on. You'll notice we've got some overlap there. Uh, it, the overlap isn't clean, of course. None of this is, is representative in, in a strict sense. But you're beginning to see a pattern here where we've got some overlap. It's not clear how they relate. And there are big areas that are not covered. We throw on yet another patch when the Federal Trade Commission begins to get aggressive about websites and uh, over-promising on websites. Again, enabling e-commerce. Gee, if we don't force the industry to clean up its act, people are going to stop using uh, e-commerce. Uh, really, I think that's a major motivate the motivator out there. And so we throw another patch on for websites. Let's see, um, we're beginning to be concerned about the identity theft uh, cases and California says, okay, let's do the security breach notification law, which now has been spreading that we had the question on that. Okay, what about uh, the notification laws that Congress is looking at? From my standpoint, this is yet another patch. It does a little something different. It covers just a little bit more data, a little different set of data, overlaps with other things and doesn't cover some other things that maybe we need to have. And then let's throw on yet another thing here. Let's see, which one did we get? Sarbanes-Oxley for big corporations like Enron. Um, and basically, now we're also getting class actions, and we've got 
Uh, Kirk calls this a bunch of grapes. Um, I think that's a fairly polite uh, phrase for what it actually is. Uh, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do I reconcile these things and make sense of them. But this is the state of American privacy law as, as we know it right now. Now, the good news on this is that if you look backwards, you can say, okay, I, we've derived a lot of the same principles from the same sorts of places. If we can remember that, then we can come to some of the same conclusions. Now, my concern is, as I say, it's, it's smelling a bit to me like the early 70s in terms of, of the sorts of in disclosures of activities that are floating around and things of that nature. Um, if we begin to have uh, even broader privacy concerns that are less focused than the sorts of things we're talking about here because this group has some very focused, specific privacy concerns. But if we get a public, uh, a large public uproar about privacy, that might be a very good thing in terms of the dialogue, but it might be a very difficult thing in terms of seeing to it that the laws that get passed in response are things that we can work with. And so we're going to need to be sort of getting ahead of it and talking about, okay, look, we can manage this. We hope, knock wood, we can ha manage this. But seriously, I think we're going to be uh, getting a more serious dialogue. I think it, we're long past due for it. And I think we need to remember history. Uh, the history in this area is so short that I'm not sure you can say that since we don't remember our history, we're doomed to repeat it. I'm not sure we're in a repetition mode yet, but I think we may be doomed to suffer some unpleasant consequences if we don't remember our history. Okay, Ken Kuski from IP3. Well, I have to say that at one level, I believe we're doing a slight disservice to a really critical issue. Um, and because we each have very short presentations, we've skated over a lot of topics that merit hours of debate and discussion. So I hope, uh, fortunately, while we didn't coordinate our, talk, our talks, I think there's a lot of common themes. And I'm going to try to fill in maybe some gaps, uh, drop some other points that I think have been very well made, but really five ideas in 10 minutes. So I get two minutes an idea. Number one, privacy is really the absence of information. So you can't have an information age and an information revolution and information technology without a phenomenal impact on privacy. And so I think, and I think we saw this in some of the, uh, particularly, uh, I liked uh, Ivan's approach, which was if we can't keep the information private, what are the consequences of its exposure? And I think that's a really, really pressing issue. Um, and Ed sort of foreshadowed one of my concluding points, which is when we think about the consequences, don't forget and I think John was playing on this, the consequences of government having information. And that's something I think we have lost sight of uh, in recent times. Uh, so I'll give you some idea of what government information. Uh, everybody alluded to TIA, Total Information Awareness. This is actually a website funded by your tax dollars. This was put up by uh, our Department of Defense research budget. Uh, December 19th, 2002, it was withdrawn from the web in a matter of days. Uh, but first it was salvaged. The immediate uh, uh, Mr. Poindexter's salvation for this project was to, it was really just needed a name change. So total information awareness was immediately changed to terrorist information alert. <laughs> These are, I couldn't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could. Um, <laughs> But I actually share this slide. Our work is with security vendors and their client base. And I share this slide with Fortune 100 IT security directors saying, this is your charter. If you want to secure your enterprise, this is what you want. And today, this model is how we prevent credit card fraud. More than any other mechanism, behavioral anomalies, how you, what you buy and how you buy and where you shop and when you shop gives me information that that's you. It's your behavior, literally, your electronic signature. And so, well, that might be scary. Again, it's this trade-off. What are the benefits? Why do we allow it? Uh, why do you go to the grocery store and forfeit all of your identity on what you purchased? Um, when I realize your cholesterol's out of range and you've bought too much red meat, uh, can I adjust your premiums? Um, well, we talk about it with smoking already. In Michigan, you can, we've supported the rights of a manufacturer to deny its employees the right to smoke on or off the job. So a, a requirement of the job is you're a non-smoker because we provide insurance and we don't want that employment out. So an employee was terminated for smoking while not at work on a weekend at home. Now what kind of privacy invasion is that? 
Um, it was a legal right of the employer to ask a, an employee to pledge and swear that they didn't smoke, and he breached that promise, and he lost his job. These things can become incredibly invasive. When we think about abortion and abortion laws, I think a lot of people missed uh, a case last year where a uh, prosecuting attorney in the state of Kansas said, I want to subpoena all abortion records within the state because, not, because there's a potential of a crime. We know that a lot of minors don't identify themselves as minors, and consensual sex below the age of 18 in Kansas for a woman is statutory rape. So any abortion of an, a minor in Kansas also carried a rape case with it. Um, does that need prosecution? Well, you know, for some political zealots, it does. So this model, while it might seem hilarious today, is occurring. You know, Ed, you know John Poindexter has gone, I mean, he told the truth afterwards. You know, he was interviewed several times. What's happening with this project? Well, it's now black funded. You know, it's off the books. This doesn't go away. We just don't get it in the public debate. I think this was a lot better in the public debate. And I think this site was an intentional effort to sabotage the public debate. You don't put up that pyramid and provoke the paranoid, you know, the Illuminati. Um, I mean, the sole purpose of this website was to curtail public debate. Uh, and that was the real crime. Um, second, the second lesson, safeguarding information for personal or enterprise purposes is vital to the 21st century. We can't go forward if we can't develop safeguards for these. Um, and I'll expand on this idea just a little bit. The enterprise today is virtual in the United States. We've gone, we've transformed an economy from a manufacturing world where labor and material were the, raw, you know, the, the elements of the production process to one of intellectual property. About 70% of US corporate net worth is not a tangible asset on the balance sheet. It's intellectual property. It means it can be stolen as bits. So how do you create property out of that? How do you defend it? How do you safeguard it? How do you prosecute these crimes? When we've made property virtual, we've also federalized an awful lot of it because it inherently is interstate. And we don't have the law enforcement agencies to protect us and enforce it. The Federal Bureau of Investigation no longer considers this their top mission. You know, they bought into the John Poindexter story. The primary, the number one mission of the Federal Bureau of Investigation today is counterterrorism. So who's going to protect us? And that's why we're doing it voluntarily. That's why we're forfeiting privacy to gain these benefits. But um, this, this challenge is going to be pretty profound. Now, there's a common theme that kept running through many of the discussions today about why don't we value privacy. And as an economist, we wrestled with this issue in the 70s when we looked at environmental issues. Uh, and it's the organizational issue. The expected loss, which is the probability times the impact, there's a variety of ways this model is used, but the, the challenge politically is when the organizational cost weighs against you. So we could have a situation where the expected loss is a dollar per person times two million people. So the expected loss is two million. The cost borne by a single, end, a single agent might be a million dollars. The cost benefit is clearly two million loss versus a million cost, you should prevent it. But if you have an organizational issue, the dollar borne by two million individuals versus a million dollars borne by a single agent, we have the best government money can buy and the organizational cost tends to lead to you know, an adverse outcome. So very, very different threats. I wanna really emphasize that privacy, we need to understand the differences between industrial espionage, between commercial espionage, between loss of privacy uh, and those implications. And so when we think about this simple model of controls of threats versus assets, the, the security analysts, we tend to look at the world from the outside and say all these horrible things could happen. But really the audit mentality, the industrial mentality should focus us on what is it we're really trying to protect? What are the assets? And those assets are very different when we think about them in, in public life and in public policy. When we think about intellectual property, how will we create it and defend it? So uh, two last points. One, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. One, because we don't have consensus, and without consensus, you have this economic problem, the adverse problem of agencies, we call it, that the organizational cost is too high 
Um, but these issues permeate everything. They permeate Roe v. Wade. They permeate identity theft. But I, I will, the one, last point I want to make here is the idea of the loss of due process. Because if the, the scariest thing in my life is the loss of due process. And counterterrorism is based on the probability that somebody might do something bad someday. It requires preemptive action. And we don't have mechanisms to address that. And so from a software, from a system point of view, we would like to be able to go back to that total information awareness and say you have the bio uh, or you have the behavioral signature of a bad guy. But it's got to be probabilistic because we get you, we want to preempt you before you, be, you before you are a bad guy. Now, if I don't have sophisticated analysis, if all I do is look for the bad books you check out, the more books you check out, the, more, the higher the probability of an incident. The more data I have on you, the higher the probability of a hit. There's no research, no analytics, no metrics that say, well, you took out 10,000 books. Of course, you're going to pick up one of the bad books in your collection. You eat out at a restaurant every night. Sooner or later, you're going to hit a Lebanese restaurant. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, preemptive, uh, preemptive is really, really, to me, the thing we should be. When you think about privacy, the loss of privacy and what are you protecting, if you have to protect against preemptive attacks, you've got a real serious threat there. So one last point, uh, and uh, we do a lot of applied research in industry, and these are topics where, these are all the different topics that uh, over 2,000 IT security directors said matter. It's cryptography, it's spam, it's wireless, it's everything. Security and compliance matter. Privacy was largely irrelevant to corporate IT security directors. Um, we really believe that privacy is the, at the heart of these three IPs, of, the internet protocol which connects all the information processing and ties intellectual property. You can't have those three without a foundation of privacy. And I think, I hope all we've done is motivate some interest and concerns um, and hopefully some forward action. So thank you. Okay, finally, Brett Matsky from PNNL. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about data mining focusing less on uh, loss of personal information and more so on once people legally get the information, what they actually do with it. The, so, yeah, cur currently most privacy laws that, that exist mostly focus on the flow of personal information. Uh, and uh, they also foster transparency. So transparency is essentially meaning like if a government agency has a database, they make it publicly accessible so that you can know what they know about you. Uh, so that's done in some cases, uh, and there's other databases that you, don't, that you don't have access to. But there's very little policy on data mining and information sharing. So once, once companies legally get the data, uh, they can pretty much do almost anything they want with it, depending on the kind of data it is. It's, you know, sometimes in medical cases, there's some restrictions, but in other types of data, there's, there are none at all. So, so data mining, uh, probably the the best thing you can relate to is profiling. Uh, the, so companies get data and then they try to put you into categories. Uh, somet sometimes it's for marketing purposes. Uh, you know, I've liter literally, like in a past life, I've worked for a marketing company and the, you know, they can, li they can literally cl cluster people in, into like 30 groups of, you know, here are the baby boomers, then they'll like these kinds of products, and here are, the, here are uh, Generation X, they'll like these kinds of products. They can get very specific, too, uh, down to, like, what kind of medical ailments uh, you, you prob you, there's a good possibility you have. So uh, that's what a lot of the classification modeling, the clustering modeling is done. And then there's querying, where it's simply uh, trying to find out specific facts. Uh, so a good, a good privacy example is database queries, uh, let's say a company has, does not have certain information, but they, they, can, they can collect data from different sources and then kind of putting all the pieces together, they, can, they might be able to figure out that sensitive information. So medical information in this example, uh, they might not know that you have a condition, but maybe they can get information on certain symptoms and be able to predict whether or not you have a medical ailment. Data mining's been around a long time. Uh, Consumer products companies have been modeling customers for ages. Kind of a newer theme is privacy-preserving data mining, which is uh, being able to 
data mine a database without revealing any information about individuals. So it doesn't focus on security. It's more so kind of scrambling the information so that you can, somebody could say, I want to find out what's the average age of this database. Uh, you know, give me some data so I can figure that out, but not revealing anything about the individuals in the database. So nothing that they can, you can, they could link back to you. The algorithms that are out there for uh, putting in privacy preserving on data is, they, they vary from very basic to very complex. So these are a couple of very basic uh, types of privacy preserving algorithms. One would be a perturbation where you simply, you add noise to, to values. So if you took a database and you had people's ages and you simply randomly found, took, uh, modified their age by a percentage, plus or minus 50%, the, then that way the age is no longer that reliable. Uh, even this example though, from plus or minus 50%, you still could probably, by looking at the data, figure out the people with the really, really high ages probably were not really young. So there's, that, there's not a perfect privacy solution there. Uh, there are better perturbation al algorithms than this, but this is a very basic one. Another one is just swapping, where you would simply take everyone's age and simply shuffle them. You know, everyone was reassigned a, di a different age randomly. So again, that, that's a, probably a better solution, is that people can't, aren't going to be able to link that information directly back to the individuals. So. A, f a future direction of privacy preserving data mining, it's got some benefits. One is uh, you could actually share data while assuring individuals' privacy. So one uh, use of this, for instance, would be in a, for research purposes. When you have multiple agencies that all have data, they want to share it, but they don't want to reveal anything about the individuals. So if, if the algorithms are good enough for the kind of application they want to use, they could, they could actually trade their data to each other without uh, revealing sensitive information about their individual people in their, in their databases. Uh, another benefit is the more you study privacy and data mining, the really it, it begins to expose what, you can, what can be revealed from data mining. So, uh, so, pe so people conduct data mining uh, in the privacy sense. They're looking to see how private the data mining technique is and they, they can actually come up with something concrete to show to legislatures and say, look, look at what people can do with this data. You know, you've, you've closed off, you said you can't look at this data, but then people can basically rebuild it using this, this other data. Uh, so that it does open some doors there. And finally, it's really a one component of a bigger solution. So that these algorithms are going to hopefully help you know, open up a few doors to some data. Maybe in other cases, maybe there's a few extreme borderline cases where data mining is being taken to a level perhaps it shouldn't be, and you know, it might open something up there to kind of close that off also. Okay, thanks. Thank you. you know, just, just to be clear, like all of these technologies, data mining has uh, an extraordinary collection of positive applications. So data mining is extracting patterns from masses of data, so it is, uh, you know, how credit card fraud is detected these days, as you've heard. It is how football teams and basketball teams figure out how to defend against opposing teams, okay? So what play are they likely to run? So there are tons of positive applications, but this uh, ability to uh, extract patterns from masses of data has uh, a set of real serious privacy implications. So thank you for joining us, and panelists, thank you very much. <laughs>